Welcome to Let's with Amplify, where we have lively entrepreneurial talks focused on helping you grow your business through sound financial strategy. Here are your hosts, Jamie L. Smith and Jesse Ferguson. Hello, I'm Jamie. Hello, I'm Jesse. And this is Let's with Amplify, lively entrepreneurial talks. Do you think that we maybe got ourselves in trouble by putting the word lively in our title? Yeah, it's anything but lively. <laughs> it's accounting, it's financial strategy, it's business. What could be more lively than that? That's true. So today we're going to talk about cash flow because it is a hot topic for every single growth business that we serve and we know that it is what keeps people up at night. Cash flow is a challenge that comes with growth. A lot of people think cash flow is a sign of distress or a dying company. But what we know is that if you're growing, things are changing. Products, services, regions, contracts, everything gets more complex, more volume. And as a result, there's challenges with cash flow. What we often see is that the leaders of the business are great at running their strategy and their growth but don't necessarily understand how to manage cash flow. So this takes them by surprise. And with that surprise comes some pretty big issues and that then can become distress. Over 80% of companies that fail do cite cash flow as a reason why they fail. And certainly when we come into clients and get the opportunity to help them with cash flow, we can see that that could be the path that they otherwise would be on. So today we're going to talk about cash flow, the inflows of cash, the outflows of cash, the timing of cash and how to predict cash and things that our CFOs and our team do with clients to help them manage their cash and sleep at night and grow their business. We'll talk a bit about the technology options and the process options as well. So I'm excited to get rolling. So Jesse, you've obviously been a CFO more than once, including our CFO, but please don't talk about our cash flow issues today. <laughs> <laughs> we have none because we manage it. Um, what would you say from an inflow perspective people sometimes forget, like the revenue, the collection side? Yeah, I mean, I hear often uh, clients that will, uh, you know, invoice, forget about invoicing for months. And uh, even though they're actually earning the revenue, uh, they don't uh, have the systems and processes in place to be able to uh, get that invoice out on a timely basis. Um, you know, we often encourage clients to try and look at at invoicing upfront. So you collect the cash before that, before you actually deliver the services. Sometimes depending on industry, that's not possible, but uh, those are some of the things that, you know, we try and make an impact on right away from an advisory perspective. It's funny because even like with our own year end, I think lawyers, are my favorite ones that are guilty of this because we have, we never receive invoices from lawyers <laughs> ever. And uh, it must be nice to be that fluid in cash that they don't care about invoicing. But it's often clear that no matter which legal firm you're working with, they don't have a process or an invoice timing schedule at all. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be nice when you're on the other side of it because you don't have to pay timely. Uh, but it certainly is a missed opportunity. And and obviously, for most of our clients, they don't have that liquidity to just forget about invoicing. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it really depends on the maturity cycle of your business and, you know, how, uh, you know, I think the earlier stage the company, the more you need to self-finance that business through your customers. And so getting ahead early is, is obviously important. It, it's obviously as well, really depends on... Uh, on the industry you're in, um, you know, when I was, uh, I was a CFO of a manufacturing distribution business uh, in a previous life and, um, you know, incredible amount of capital up front uh, for purchasing inventory with long lead times. Uh, and so the working capital cycle on that was long. And so the quicker, you know, when I took over uh, that company, um, you know, I guess, trying as much as possible to get invoices out the door when you were already sitting on inventory for months and months and months um, was crucial. Even just 30 days, tightening it by 30 days made a huge impact. 
Yeah, for sure. And I think obviously first step is invoicing and then you have the fun part of collections, right? Mm. And uh, you can't even start to collect if you haven't taken the time to invoice. So if we switch to that part of the inflows of cash, you know, we've actually made some major differences right within Amplify. And a lot of our clients have started to use our playbook when it comes to accounting services in relation to both invoicing and receivables and collections. What do you think would be the top wins that just get it done, right? Get the cash in the door. Yeah. I I mean, sticking to putting in a, 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 a good, clear, uh, I guess, process, especially into the sales cycle. Um, you know, I think the more you can push expectations around collections in the sales cycle, the more you're probably on the back end going to win because your clients are more uh, trained in terms of how you're going to conduct business with them. Um, and so I think, I think, Starting in the sales cycle, here's what our collections efforts looks like. Here's what our terms are, um, you know, it, and here's when you can expect if you're not paying your bills, when we'll shut you down. So just putting those red lines in place um, will not only help your own cash flow, but will actually help with growth because um, at the end of the day, if if you're an organization that has, you know, a sales culture, um, there's nothing worse than an angry accounting department coming in and, and, and I guess delivering a different experience than what your operational team and sales team are, are giving, um, their clients. I think that what we hear from our team members is exactly what you just said. Like, just starting with your last point, you know, the cash register, whether or not you're a service company, a business to business company, a product company, it doesn't matter. That cash register experience of the experience of actually paying needs to be consistent with the expectations that you are sold, right? So you can't have a salesperson and a delivery team um, giving a great product and a great experience and a great service and then have some bitchy accountant uh, collecting and sending nasty emails, right? That can that can break the whole cycle. And, and you do sometimes see an inconsistency with what the expectations are from a business partnering and treating customers and treating clients. And that doesn't help collections, right? And that doesn't help uh, repeat sales either. No, for sure. Um you know, generally speaking, I like to see an escalation process in, in your AR process. You know, obviously step one is, did you get the invoice? Um, you know, how many times an invoice is 50 days late? And then you ask someone in your AR collections team, well, has anyone contacted them that they actually received the invoice? Totally. Uh, like even in the no. big four days, <laughs> if you recall. Yeah. It was, I mean, the response we got almost every time we called up. We don't have that invoice. Yeah. (laughs) How are we going to pay the invoice if we don't have it? Exactly. And it gives them more grace and uh, the benefit of the doubt if you're following up on receipt of the invoice as opposed to diving straight into collections. And that seems like a really little communication change, but it makes a big difference to the actual cash inflow of many clients that we see. Yeah, I think as well, you can really actually strengthen your relationship, your customer relationship um, in your collection process. If you have a company that um, a client of yours or customer that's, let's say, is struggling a bit in terms of their own cash flow, um, being able to, you know, speak to them like like fellow partners and not just a transactional, um, you know, AR, AP type of situation. Um you know, you can really actually strengthen the relationship because you're actually helping them out of their own situation. Um, obviously, you got to, you know, stick to your own policies in terms of you, you don't want one customer sinking you, so to speak. But, um, you know, it being able to say, hey, you know, I expected this to be paid in 30 days, but you need an extra 30 days. That's okay. Let's keep in communication over those 30 days and, and then, uh, and then helping them through whatever situation they're in is, is, is it will actually strengthen the retention of that client for sure, because they know that you're on their side and you're not there to just, um, purely just collect money in the door. Yeah. And I think, you know, it is that alignment between the different departments. So 
your sales team, your product or service delivery team, your accounting team, it's all consistent in terms of how they treat clients, how they communicate and their messaging. And they all understand the terms and conditions because that's another thing that we've seen with a lot of clients where, for example, and we were talking about it a little bit this morning, there's a lot of sales teams out there that have a lot of empowerment to get the deal done and have minimal structure or tools um, to lean on. And when that happens, the terms and conditions of every single contract or product sale can be different. And how many times does that salesperson communicate those slight changes to the delivery team? And then you can have a miss on expectations there, let alone to the counting, because they certainly aren't talking to the counting. And that alignment and consistency and um, talking to each other internally can result in dollars in the bank quicker, I think. And that's what I see with a lot of our clients. And it's, again... It seems like common sense, but it's missed in a lot of cases and in a lot of industries. For sure. So outflows. I think I checked with uh, our CFOs on Tuesday about what they would highlight as the most critical thing you could do to help manage cash and where they see the biggest difference. And what they said is having a payables schedule that's either biweekly or weekly is the easiest thing you can do to manage cash. So outflows being the payment to vendors, I think, and I might be speaking in absolutes, but I think pretty much every single client that we start with touches payables daily, basically. And so it's a matter of the executives, the founders, what have you, they get an invoice, they check their bank, they have enough money, they pay the invoice. They get an invoice, it's Fred, Fred's incredibly important. So they're like in a rush and a panic to find the money to pay Fred. Then other cases, an invoice comes in, they don't have the money or they don't have the time to check or they don't really know who the vendor is and it gets lost like under the Kleenex box on the desk or in today's world, it gets sent to clutter in your inbox, right? And so there's a complete inconsistency and payables are being touched every single day. And as a result of that, uh, there's a lot of time that's been taken, but more importantly, they're not able to meet their strategy and their growth because they have no idea how much money has to go out and where they are from a cash flow perspective, let alone payroll where you're paying, you know, we've seen clients where when we come in, they'll pay, you know, a very, very material invoice on a Tuesday, forgetting that they have payroll on Friday. And then they're in full on panic, not sleeping, you know, it's impacting their marriage and their life with their kids because, Payroll is the most critical thing that they have to do as a business, by and large. And so a payable schedule and limiting it to weekly at most and biweekly at best, which is offset by payroll, is the quick win that we hear from our CFOs consistently. What do you think about that? I think it's uh, it's always good in business to have predictability. So... Um I mean, that's why employees come to you as employees because they have a predictable pay. If if you're paying them pretty ad hoc, uh, you're probably going to lose a lot of employees. And this week, it's you know you're going to get paid at the end of the month this month, and maybe we'll pay you weekly next week. You know, it, it, you're going to lose a lot of uh, employees from that uh, unpredictableness. So the more you can, um, the more you can predict, uh, predict and schedule and. I guess process your payables process is important. Plus, it also just helps from an employee job satisfaction perspective. You know, if if you're a controller or a, you know an accounts payable person and you're constantly uh, putting out fires and having to pay this vendor and that vendor and open up the bank every single day to to figure out how to do that, it. it you know, every every time you're doing that, it probably takes you out of flow on whatever else you're working on, and and so uh, being able to schedule and predict that from a, just an internal workflow perspective probably adds to your to your own employee retention. For sure, and I think um, too, what's sometimes a bit of a surprise is that vendors like predictability and consistency too. And to be honest, the majority of vendors would rather know, okay, I'm getting paid every two, every second Thursday and I'm consistently getting paid full balance. And if there's any exceptions to that, I'm going to get 
prompt and timely communication. And as such, they don't have to do the collections. They don't have to be chasing you down and calling you. So they're saving real time and money by not chasing you, by not fretting over whether or not they're going to get paid. And so to be honest, waiting two weeks and consistently and predictably being paid without any chase or any extra communication can be more valuable than being paid today, the day that the invoice went out. Um, and that comes to a surprise, I think, of a lot of our customers. But then if they put themselves in the other shoes, they see it, how saving that collections and that stress is absolutely worth it. Yeah, I mean, I always, um, you know, if you have endless amount of money in the bank, the payables process is pretty easy. Um, you know, it, it could be improved from a, you know, a, just a more an employee perspective, but it's not payroll and, and expense and payables are just a part of doing business. But, you know, I've see, where I think you can really, um, really make where I see the actual real challenges is when you're in a cash flow crunch. And the common mistakes I always see is I'm in a cash flow crunch. I, I don't have the money or the bank uh, line of credit to be able to fund the payment of this vendor. And so um, they, they take the approach of running and hiding, you know, and, and so running and hiding is not a solution. It's so not a recommendation that I give to clients. Um, you know, I remember when my first CFO job, uh, I walked in, we had, uh, way more payables than we had cash in the bank. And that was three or four months out. And, uh, a mentor of mine who was, who came in as CEO said to me, what customers want is to understand if they're going to get paid. And so the timing of that payment doesn't really matter, but they want to know. And so we, we deployed the strategy of, you know, let's say you had 10 key vendors um, that uh, you owed money to put together a payment schedule, treat them almost like a fixed, uh, a fixed liability debt. Right. And even offer, I'll pay a little bit of interest and, you know, figure out how much you can afford to pay and then stick to that schedule. So if it's, you know, $5,000 a week and they owe a hundred grand, well, it's going to take you six months to get paid off, but at least you're getting cash. And so they can actually feel comfortable that they're going to get paid. There's nothing worse than having a customer that you know is in financial difficulty but they're hiding from you and you have zero, um, zero, uh, you know, I guess transparency, transparency whether you're going to get paid. So a little bit of cash is better than no cash. Yeah. So I think, uh, that schedule payment and clear communication and focusing on timing as much or more than the actual dollar value made a massive difference for some of our highly impacted clients during COVID too. And the CFOs um, at Amplify, you know, made a point of getting the clients to be vulnerable and be willing to do that communication, even though really what you're communicating is I'm not meeting the terms and conditions, but here's an alternative, <laughs> which is a bit embarrassing and vulnerable for a business owner and a business leader for sure but it goes a long ways and to your point a lot of uh, a lot of vendors you know that's that's actually all they need that predictable and clear communication of when they're going to get paid obviously you know you can't take advantage and um, fund a business off your vendors uh, on an ongoing basis under every economic circumstance, because <laughs> you're gonna get you're gonna get yourself into a bit of hot water if you do that. But every business has volatility, especially growing businesses, and and your vendors want to be part of that growth. Like most vendors want to be part of an exciting growth story, so they're going to understand where you're coming from. Yeah, and and in addition, I mean, if your uh, customer is buying your services. Presumably, they need your services as well. So, uh, and if they like your services and you're adding value to their business, well, then why would they want you to go away as a business? So, yeah. Um, so there's always that as well. 
So you alluded to it, and I think we've seen it a lot of times, and it's, you know, it's a bit cliche, but I don't know that we all remember. The best time to get debt is when you don't need debt. And one of the best ways to handle cash flow is having an operating credit line where you can be a lot less focused and stressed on your cash coming in and out because you have that buffer. Obviously, when you're in a negative position or you have a poor forecast or no forecast, uh, your ability to get that financing and lending is harder. But when you're in a good cash position, you can get debt that you don't actually need yet. And it can make a really incredible difference for for funding growth, not from a capital perspective of funding growth, but from a working capital perspective of funding growth. And so certainly the clients that have decent operating credit lines and use them purely for working capital and not for funding major investments and expenditures they sleep better at night. There's no question about that. And the relationship with the bankers is is worth any stress that that might cause, um, knowing that you have a buffer in the bank. So what do you think about credit and debt and financing? Yeah, I think every, every company should be trying their best to get banked and have uh, a rainy day uh, line of credit or whatever that is or you know or putting aside money within your own retained earnings if your bank debt averse then uh, put some savings away ie through retained earnings profit to uh, to live to be able to uh, you know if if the rainstorm gets heavy so to speak um, similar to like COVID, um, you're not in a position where, you know, your results have tanked overnight and now you're begging for money because going in a strength of going to anybody in a, in a position of strength is always more, you're going to get a lot better terms and conditions and everything than when you're on your knees, uh, trying to, uh, beg and plead for money. Yeah. And in today's world, I mean, the speed of getting financing, even if it's a smooth, yes, 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 the whole way through process, it, it's not fast. You know, banks aren't fast. Private lenders aren't fast. Like no, nobody that's handing over money does it with urgency. And so if you're in a position of, of begging, you're usually also in a position of urgency. And that's just not a realistic expectation to even get the money in that case, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean... I think the common mistake that I see when I come into a client that's, you know, uh, has an established business, you know, they, they aren't in startup mode where they're not quite sure if they're going to even make it through that startup. But once they've kind of established that customer base and they have, you know, I guess, uh, longer term employees, whether that's a couple of years or 10 years, it doesn't really matter. But, uh, the, the big mistake is people, uh, especially a lot of accountants out there, I find is they don't uh, maintain their balance sheet well enough. Um, and when, and all that really means is the timing um, and, uh, and accruals, really. It's pretty easy. I mean, uh, if you're invoicing a customer for an entire job up front and you invoice them and all your revenue goes into one month and then you incur expenses over 12 months uh you know when you send those statements to the bank uh they're gonna say you had one good month you lost money the rest of the months when in reality uh you've had 12 good months um in addition you know, a bank needs to understand current ratios and um, all the different balance sheet ratios that they do to bank customers. And if if your balance sheet is only really updated at year end audit time, um, good luck trying to run a balance sheet for a, for a bank, and they'll laugh you out of the door. I mean, unless you're just making money handful, then I guess you're not going to the bank anyways because you just have so much cash that you don't really think about it. But you know, I think uh, COVID really probably expose that for a lot of clients that got caught kind of, I guess, being complacent around cash flow because they always had so much of it. Um, and so, you know, maintaining a, 
I, I, you don't need to be a perfect balance sheet, but you know, a, a somewhat predictable and and being as close to the actual reality of what your business looks like is, I think, crucial. Interested in diving deeper into the topic of this episode? Every episode of Let's with Amplify has an accompanying ebook for you to download absolutely free. Visit amplifyadvisors.ca slash category slash Let's Media to get access to the accompanying ebook for this episode. Each ebook helps you get the most out of the discussion that we have on each and every show. Head over to amplifyadvisors.ca slash category slash Let's Media to get access to the ebook now. One of my favorite stories is, uh, is one of the CFOs went on a brand new job. And one of the first things they said was, we need to fire the bank. They're horrible. Um, we can't work with that bank anymore. And then they looked at the situation <laughs> and the accountant, like the bookkeeper, was sending balance sheets that don't even balance. And so they went to the client and they're like, you know, there's a really good chance that this bank and this banker is, is actually fairly reasonable and their questions aren't that crazy. I mean, you were sending information that's absolutely wrong <laughs> and and it's and it's very clear that it's not right mm -hmm. and so i think i can recover this relationship with the bank and i think we maybe can work together and it's always easier to stay stay with a bank that knows you and, and where you haven't missed payments or you haven't actually screwed up other than bad information which is a major screw up too but not the same as literally missing payments or missing expectations and uh, and of course, by the time by the time we got there, the relationship was too damaged, and the trust wasn't there. So we did have to help them switch to a new bank. But we see that oftentimes that was one specific story where the balance sheet wasn't balancing, which made me think of your comment. And that's a thing. A balance sheet is um, is a statement that's you know not well understood by most people, even accountants and even bankers, um, and certainly a lot of business owners don't pay attention to their balance sheet and they may not even understand their balance sheet, which is nothing to be embarrassed about at all. And as such, don't understand it, don't use it, don't put any importance to it. But the reality is, to your point, the users, especially bankers, do put importance to it. And frankly, a lot of times they're just checking a checklist. They might not understand it either, but they're looking for very specific things, whether they understand it or not. So they're going to have to fill in the blanks and, and figure out a story if it's not clear and it's not right, <laughs> which that story is probably not going to be in your favor. <laughs> I mean, the the reality with with a balance sheet and and a income statement is um, there shouldn't actually be that much predictab unpredictability in in your numbers um, because I don't think your business is actually operating like that. Um, you know, I think for the most part you're not doing 80% of your revenue in one month. You might invoice an 80% of your revenue in one month, but you're not probably doing all the work in one month. Otherwise, uh, maybe some companies are, but most aren't. And uh, and being able to, I guess, smooth out the, that, that revenue. And then on the expense side, the same thing, um, you know, especially when you see... Um, you know, prepaids and the more softwares that are out there. And, you know, even, even, uh, you know, for, for time and materials companies that are expensing their, their hours into the current month, but they actually don't bill it in the next month. And then they wonder why, why is my gross margin go from 10% to 70% the next month? It's like, well, that actually didn't happen. You're just, your record keeping doesn't reflect what reality is on the ground. So I think the more you can um, give predictability around your your financial results to bankers, um, you know, bankers, they, I don't want to call them lazy, but the, the more predictable and less risky they see their clients, the more they're not going to worry about you. And that's, that's the best type of relationship you have with a bank. They don't really talk to you unless you need them. Yeah. And I think it goes true for decision makers too, right? Like on Monday, I opened November 2021's financials and they were not, uh, they were not looking the way I was predicting. And so instead of looking at the date and double checking, I opened the right file. I went into full on panic and sent you what, 15 questions of how is this happening? Why is this happening? What's going on? 
And uh, on the one hand, I felt pretty stupid when you told me you're looking at the wrong year. But on the other hand, I was pretty happy with myself because I'm like, oh, I know my numbers well enough to just be completely shocked and concerned and, and confused by the fact that I was reading the wrong numbers. <laughs> Though it is funny because I was, I did feel gaslit. I was like, what did you do, Jesse? Why is, why are these numbers are wrong? This is not the business I ran this month. This must be a CFO problem. <laughs> Uh, and it turns out it was neither. It was, well, it was my fault because I opened the wrong year. But the reality is decision makers should be reading and using their numbers to make decisions frequently enough that it is predictable. And when they open it, they know what to expect and they and it should be telling a story that they already know. And it should be reflecting a story that they've already lived. And to your point, that means if you're still serving a client, but you booked all the revenue in March and it's now sitting here in September, That that's not your story because mm. your people are out there serving that client. And so, you know, when I think about cash-based accounting versus accrual-based accounting, there is a bias to accrual-based accounting. If you want to grow, you need to do accrual-based accounting. That's what your financiers are going to expect. That's what your decision makers need. That is better and more accurate information. And so uh, a ton of bookkeepers out there don't do that, right? That's not what's expected of them. And, and they just do cash-based accounting, which essentially is accounting for the purpose of record keeping and, and tax, tax returns, right? That's what it's for. I've, I've heard a lot of clients saying, well, my tax person, he's an accountant, a designated accountant, said, um, you know, don't worry about accruals. We'll handle those at your end. And I just cringe. Yeah. Right? right? Like, it's like, sure. Because they're not wrong. Right? No, not they're on not the wrong, purpose is tax. For sure not. But when you bring a management accounting lens to it, they're absolutely wrong. Because what's the purpose of those numbers? It's to help you make, give comfort around the decisions, business strategies that you want to go into. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't like to... Th I don't think numbers should drive um, whether you, I mean, they're going to have an impact, but you know, there's a, especially in the clients that we serve, I think they have the reason they got into business is they have a really good gut feel on markets and, you know, trends and um, opportunities on when to chase things and when not to. With that said, um, if if you're taking on too much risk, chasing a lot of opportunities, um, and you don't have and you have a really good, you know, set of numbers onto you, that will also slow you down because it's like, you know what? Like, if I take on too many of these gambles, we're not in a good enough financial position that if some of these bets don't pay off, um, that we're going to be in trouble. We need to slow down, or at least go find some new money to take those bets on, right? Yeah. And I think it that raises a good point of when it comes to cash flow, another major consideration, and one of our CFOs was emphasizing that just on Thursday when we were having the meeting on marketing and sales, not every revenue item is the same and not every profit item is the same. And taking into consideration the impact on cash is critical, right? And so you mentioned it earlier, obviously, if you have an opportunity to bill up front or do retainer-based billing, that's one way to take into consideration your revenue with a cash flow component. Um, when you take big gambles, like you were just mentioning, like, you know, you score the, the Costco or the Walmart, but you have to think about that, not just from a revenue perspective, not just from a profit perspective, but what's the cash flow that's going to be required because in order to serve those major deals, the cash has to be spent up front and earned and then and collected subsequent. And that stress and volatility and um, an impact to cash may make that deal not nearly as lucrative as it seems if you only look from a sales and revenue or even profit perspective. So not uh, every revenue I, I and mean, not every profit's the same. Yeah. I mean, we we were very close to going into Costco uh, in a former life of mine. Um, and when you dug into the contract, uh, a big 
a portion of there's a, ma- a large amount of risk on the in the back tables. So if you didn't have sell throughs that they thought you know were acceptable to them, you were at risk at having to take product back. Um, in addition, warranties were all on the hook for you that you were taking back that inventory at full pop. And when you actually started to run the the models on those and put those liabilities, because that's what they are, liabilities on the on the balance sheet, uh, when you run the P&L of that customer, it didn't look as good as uh, what, what we originally thought it was. And, you know, by the time you... Um, you know, you uh, ran those numbers and and figure out, you're like, is the risk actually worth it? And for some clients, maybe it is. Um, And for others, it's not. It doesn't mean there's a right or wrong solution, but at least be aware and have the lights on versus, you know, being walking through the dark and all of a sudden uh, something hits you over the head, like, you know, 10 pallets showing back up at your door because the your manufacturer didn't um, produce uh, the quality of product that you that you would have liked. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, that goes back to what you have from liquidity in general. Do you have an operating credit line to help you get through th- those bumps in the terms and conditions? Do you have the liquidity from other major clients or, or consistent and, and revenue for us, streams? We didn't have that. Yeah. Right? Like we were already um, challenged from a cash flow perspective, and this would have placed a considerable amount of. In addition, I mean, the, the size of orders that they wanted to, get, to play, place with you was like massive but the problem is we had to order those goods you know that we tried to push for deposits so that they could kind of fund that inventory themselves but if you're unless you they really 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 want you um you're not gonna be in the driver's seats to drive those kind of outcomes you prefer yeah i mean even if you have a situation where you can get money up front through deposits or retainers what have you you have to be prepared to fund without that collection mm-hmm. uh otherwise you can't really make that commitment and so those are some details that make a big big difference it's funny because the same things that create value in a business when you're trying to sell and the same things that um a banker or an investor looks at when they're taking the risk on those things often contribute to healthy cash management and cash flow. Right. And that's the, you know, the, the types of contracts you have, the detail, the devil's in the details and the terms and conditions and the commitments and how, how that's all going to flow through the business. Cause ultimately not to be cheesy, but cash is like the blood flow of a business, right? So if you don't have that blood flowing through at a nice, steady, predictable pace, that has a massive impact on whether or not you have a healthy, valuable, bankable business. And so if you're going to start anywhere when it comes to money, obviously cash is the place to start, not just because you want to sleep at night, but because it actually makes a difference in every area. Um So the second thing that the CFO said was of the most critical value when they get in and they get a chance to work with clients is the ability to forecast um, and to know where the cash is going to be. And so, you know, at the core of good forecasting for cash is a lot of the stuff we've already talked about in terms of predictability, process, uh, consistency, but also at the core is, you know, the boring reality of historical data tends to repeat itself. So the better your books and records and the better your historical information, the more likely you are going to be able to predict. So the reality is, and and you kind of mentioned, um, businesses aren't actually as crazy or as exciting um, as some people think. The reality is like last April is going to have a lot in common with this April for most businesses. And the difference between last April and this April will be easily understood and pinpointed by the business owner, whether it be a new region or a new product or or just uh, the 20% growth or what have you. But but there's the foundational core oftentimes repeats itself. History repeats itself. So 
it's not sexy and it's not fun, but the reality is the better your record keeping is, the more timely and accurate, the better you're going to be able to predict your cash and make a decisions accordingly. And I think we've seen that. And obviously it's not fun to clean up financial records, but there's value in it. It's hard to understand that because it just seems like a lot of busy work and a lot of backbreaking labor, but it makes a difference in your ability to predict. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, for most clients that we go into, I would I would probably somewhat disagree in that last year looks like this year. I would say it's last month probably looks closer to this month. Right, it depends on the industry for right. sure. Um, but regardless, whatever whatever period you're holding to, whatever that period needs to be right. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, the more right it is, the more you can predict. Uh, what the future looks like. And unfortunately, um, you know, financial models are, I've seen way too many times where, you know, they're predicting this crazy EBITDA number and cash flow number. And, and then they're doing it on, they're basing all these assumptions on, you know, maybe the wrong starting point. Um, so the more you can start know where you're starting from, from a forecast perspective, the, probably the more likely it's going to be right, or at least no, nothing's ever right, but closer to right. Yeah. Let's just touch on that for a minute. How many accountants especially don't want to forecast because it's not going to be right? Mm -hmm. And that actually is a barrier that paralyzes them because I can't predict the future, therefore why should I try? And the reality is forecasting, it's not about being right. It's about directional, right? And it's about knowing where the pain points are and knowing where the stress is coming and making decisions accordingly in terms of that invoicing, uh, in terms of that big sale, whether you can actually fund it in terms of, um, in terms of how you pay your vendors. That's what it's about. It's not about getting, you know, $101 in the bank on February 23rd. And if you actually have, uh, 50, you're a failure, right? That's not what it's about. It's about directional trends and decision making. And that's hard for, perfectionists. I think we see that, especially at the controller level, um, not wanting to be wrong. Yeah, I think there's definitely always going to be an element of that for sure. I mean, it's, you're, uh, it's pretty vulnerable. Uh, you have to show a lot of vulnerability admitting that as soon as you put that forecast out, it's probably wrong. Um, but I always say a forecast really is just a business plan uh, in numbers. And most businesses, the reason they can't forecast is because they don't actually have a plan moving forward, what the next year looks like, what the next two years, three years. Um, and it doesn't mean that that business plan does, shouldn't change, but if it changes, so should your financial plan that, that shows uh, predictability and where you're headed financially. And, you know, you make a business plan and you do a forecast that doesn't support that business plan, you should probably change your business plan. Otherwise, you're going to be out of business pretty quickly. Now, hey, some businesses, they fly by the seat of their pants and everything turns out. But, um, you know, for every one of those businesses, there's 10 that uh, that don't make it, right? And the stats show it, how many businesses fail every single year in Canada, across, across the world, really. Yeah. And I think you're absolutely right. There's people that have dreams, so they would claim to have plans. Sure but they're not able to quantify them because they don't have it at a business plan level, right? And so it sure. can be a bit like shocking, right? Because they, if you do quantify those dreams or those plans, that's when you might realize, okay, you're going to, you're going to start selling product in Edmonton. Well, it's going to take, sure. You're going to make a hundred thousand this year in your first year of business. That's awesome. And, and it's a great gross margin and EBITDA percentage. So everything's uh, smelling like roses, right? But you forget that to earn that hundred thousand at the end, you got to fund X amount at the beginning. And where's that coming from? Is that coming from your Calgary customer base? Is Are you going to, you know, chop off your hand, uh, the hand that feeds you type of thing? Or or do you need an operating credit line to fund it? Or in reality, is that strain on liquidity not not so beautiful for the 100000 after all, right? Well, I, I mean, we see businesses all the time that, 
you know, start expanding geographically and start signing leases and, uh, you know, commit to those leases and start cash flow going out the door and then try and back into a plan after that in terms of hiring, in terms of uh, how to fund it, you know, what their actual losses are for fun, for getting through that, or I'll call it investment for now, but could turn into losses. Um, and, you know, how many of those businesses uh, actually do their sales more harm? Because once you, if you go into a market and you, you know, you put your, put your, sign up uh it looks pretty pretty bad when a year later you're taking your sign down and you're leaving that market you know it's gonna reputationally gonna be really challenging to get back into the market uh in the future doing it the right way so you know that plan is you know definitely an operational plan um you know uh, you know, and, and, and helps you think through what, what are the risks here? What are the, what are the steps we need to take? And then really the last part of it is, is what is, what does that look like from a financial picture? And the problem with most companies is they're the, the accountants or the, you know, the, the finance people have a hard time putting together that plan because they're actually not part of that planning. And so, you know, the, the, the best thing uh, you can do is ensure you have a really good finance person that's part of those conversations that can bring a financial lens to those business plans. Yeah, and thinks business before they think numbers sure. so that they can translate the business into the numbers for mm-hmm. sure. The, um, the Sometimes we get questions, and I'm not a big fan of it, and maybe back in the day when business was just different or simpler, it made sense, but we get questions about, you know, what's the, what's the perfect amount of cash reserve you should have? Like, is it three months operational or is it six months operational? And, and, you know, even when we go to some of the training courses that are put on by others, they're very, they're very specific. They're like, it used to be three months cash flow should be in your, should be at your disposal. Now it's six since COVID and as if there's an absolute answer. And I, I get turned off by that because I think there's, businesses, I mean, to the points that we've already mentioned, if you're a cash-based business and you're running a restaurant and every person pays on their way out the door at a literal cash register, that is a very different cash expectation than if you're um, if you're in a complex oil and gas service company and you're lucky to get paid in whatever the rules are these days, 90 days or whatever, right? Like to say that those two companies should have the same cash reserve is ridiculous. Not to mention the fact that one has hourly employees that they can change within a week or two's notice and the other one has professionals or engineers that's, you know, really, really high base with no variables. So I think it's crazy, but I know that our listeners probably want to know the answer. My answer is it depends on how quick cash flows through your business. And based on that, you need to also look at your risk tolerance and what makes sense for you. The next question being, do you count your operating credit line and your working capital credit line in that reserve or not? And that is very much a personal decision for every business, in my opinion. But what is your thoughts? I mean, actually, we're a little bit different on this. I'm probably more risk adverse uh, because... I'm not the CFO of Amplify, so I can always blame you if it goes wrong. Maybe that's why I'm less, <laughs> more likely to take a risk. Um, you like more cash than I could care for. What do you think? I think your experiences scar you, or, or um, you know, or 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 keep you blind, so to speak. Uh, so, you know, for me, having lived through a couple on the verge of bankruptcy type of situations. I like a little bit of reserves to, uh, to live for uh, a rainy day. I think, um, I think it instills more discipline in management decision-making, um, probably more thought process around spending cash. Uh, if you have that, uh, Hey, you know, we're not going to just leverage up and, and go for this. Um, with that said, I, I think it all is ratio dependent at the end of the day. You know, if you have a very profitable business um, and you're growing, you're managing to, to your ratios and what you, what the bank will 
leverage to you for um, for that uh, for the bank servicing that you're that you're taking on or what have you. Um, so you know where I see private businesses probably get into trouble is uh, owners that have personal. Uh, lavish lifestyles that need a lot of cash out of the business and so they unfortunately drain the business of cash for their own personal needs um, which then puts a lot of stress on the business that they actually need for their own cash flow so you know i think it's i think there's there's maturity depending on the stage of maturity of a business you know at the earlier stage companies they generally get in trouble because of one of two things they haven't paid their taxes and they don't have the cash set aside for that or they've taken out too much dividends from the company bankers do not like that when you know they they bank, bankers love owners that live within their means personally you know i, I can't how I, I can't uh tell you how many times I've heard a banker, what kind of car does he drive? <laughs> Did you, so you, I'm helping the business by driving my shitty right. rep for <laughs> Right. Like, does he drive a X5, $100,000 vehicle when, you know, I know what this business makes right now. So, you know, that's... Maybe I'll drive JD's car next yeah. time we go to a bank meeting. <laughs> right. I mean, you can't... <laughs> the mirror's yeah. taped on. <laughs> you, know, never, you never want to make too many assumptions, but they do. I mean, that's just life. And so, you know, I think that's one one type of um, type of business cycle. And then the other one is, you know, where they move past that kind of startup phase where, you know, they're kind of in the scale up yeah. scale up phase kind of that 15 to 40 million dollar range um and the business generates enough income to support the owners of that business regardless and now there's quite a bit left over um so from that perspective i think it's really just a leverage ratio game and if you have a good balance sheet and you you know you then how much how much um cash should you have on hand is really going to be driven by ratios so yeah. yeah so you're not a believer in the absolute specific answer either no no definitely not no i think it just depends it's a complicated question it is i think so too the other question that we'll sometimes get is how often should you forecast cash and i think that first and foremost depends probably more on more than anything on your process and automation. So the clients that use like the Helms or the dry runs, which are great local options, and there's a plug and play with their accounting system. I mean, they legitimately have a reasonable cash forecast daily without any actual effort. And then, uh, and then oftentimes I know that the CFOs will look at those forecasts on a weekly basis to get it a little, the next level of detail and just that much more um, specific. I know, that when I was a CFO, we absolutely forecasted cash daily because there was a lot of manual effort that we had to put into the forecast, but it was easier to spend five minutes a day doing the manual updates and then having a forecast that was accurate and detailed daily than to spend, you know, an hour or two on a weekly basis because the total time took longer if you... Uh, touched it only weekly because you had to get your head back into it and get into the routine. So the controller always did it daily. And even when we weren't in a cash flow challenging issue and we weren't funding any particular growth and I would tell him like, hey, buddy, you don't have to do this daily. He just said it's five minutes a day or it's two hours a week. <laughs> Which one should it be? Um, so it really I think it depends how often you should be forecasting cash. Obviously, how challenging your cash flow situation is and, and the types of questions and growth that are going to be pushed by your executive so that you have that at the tip of your finger fingers if you need it. I think those are the types of things that would drive it along with the process and technology you're using. But um, other people would suggest that your forecasting of cash should specifically be every 13 weeks and and, and updated every week. I've heard that from some of our competitors. And I just, I think it's similar that there's no exact right answer, but what are your thoughts and what have you seen successful? I mean, it depends on <laughs> what your financial situation is, right? If yeah. you're struggling to pay your bills, I would probably suggest getting on top of a weekly, weekly to daily forecast because every 
every charge that hits your bank account is something you may not be able to pay for someone else. And, you know, you run, run the liability. I remember when, um, at, at my previous, in my previous life, we, we had effectively only one vendor that could shut us down tomorrow if we didn't pay them on time, which was the shipping companies who were distributing inventory and things like that. And we knew one, we couldn't get inventory in without the shippers and we couldn't get inventory out. So, you know, we, we, we had, they were a priority cash flow line item and that's, you know, we, we had to do that, uh, sometimes daily. And then we moved to weekly once we kind of at least um, moved out of the the burning fire into just a slow burning fire. So, um, but a, but if you're a company that has tons of cash in the bank, and eh, I would probably, you know, I, I, I sometimes you may not even want to do a forecast. Why? If your business isn't changing, it's just a bunch of work you're doing to what make make yourself feel like you're going to be richer than you already are. I don't know. I mean. We don't, I, I, I don't think that that's worth it. Now, if your business is planning, you're making business decisions for growth. Absolutely. Do the work there, put in the forecasting, but, or you're going out for new financing or whatever. Sure. You need to do a, that forecast, but you know, I, I think the circumstances and again, where you are in your business cycle will, um, should dictate what the, how, oh, what the right course is. So, in my opinion, there's two biggest myths when it comes to cash that I see from business owners. The first, we talked about it a bit, is that it's, you know, cash flow challenges are because of distress. When the reality is, if you plan to grow, you will have cash flow challenges. There will be changes and complexities to your cash via the growth because all of a sudden you've got new customers, they pay different you have a new relationship. It's just startup costs, startup costs of getting those, the marketing and the branding, everything about it. Right. You have, you have expenditures that you're paying different vendors, different terms and conditions, um, different situations. So the, there's just everything about cash changes and with change is challenges. Doesn't mean you can't manage that though. You can absolutely manage it from a lot of the things we just talked about, but it will be challenging because that's the nature of growth and that's the nature of change. So you can get ahead of it, you can manage it, and you can avoid a distressed situation. So I think the one thing I want to tell business owners is that you can get ahead of it, you can manage it, you don't have to be embarrassed, and you don't have to feel that by admitting that you have cash flow challenges, that you're inherently admitting that you're in distress. That's not the case. If you're growing, you're going to have the challenges. And all your friends that are business owners have it too. And none of them are talking about it, right? So that's the one myth I just really hope that we can break down today. The second one is the idea that you can manage cash by opening your bank statement on your mobile and looking at your actual bank balance. And uh, so many business owners think that the bank balance is a meaningful number and it's not. And it's scary that they're even looking at it in some ways because it, you know, There'll be a days where it's a high, very positive number and it makes them feel confident in a way that isn't necessarily a deserved confidence because guess what? It's Thursday. I have millions in my bank and then I have millions in payroll on Friday. Uh, and, and similarly, it can be, you know, distressful and negative if the number is lower than you anticipated, not recognizing that your receivables clerk has put a lot of effort in and has a really big check that's cashing again tomorrow, right? So to me, the myth of looking at a bank balance and thinking that's a meaningful number and using it to manage a business is just a scary reality and one that a lot of business owners uh, use to make decisions. So what are your thoughts? I mean, have you seen that with some of our clients as well? Yeah, I think it's human nature to uh, look at a bank balance as an owner and, you know, see success doesn't really tell a story. I mean, I don't think it's not nothing. I mean, if you're sitting there with negative big numbers, you know, it's probably going to, give you uh, something to look into, um, so to speak. But, 
you know, if you're managing the business properly, you know, it's just a, it's a timing thing at the end of the day. You know, I, I always like to think the balance sheet is a, is a, is accumulation of great management one way or the other, right? If you have a strong balance sheet, it means you probably have a strong um, operational business, um, not just one year, but years. And the longer that business is run well, the stronger your balance sheet is going to be because it's just an accumulation of every single year that you've been in business. And so, um, you know, I think, I think cash in the bank is not a bad thing, but it doesn't really tell you a story. For sure. So we talked about how with cash, it's a challenge because of growth and there's <sighs> ways to manage it. And we talked about collections, invoicing, timing of revenue, making a big, big difference, having everybody aligned and telling the same story and getting ahead of getting that cash into the business. We talked about one of the quickest and easiest wins is getting on a payable schedule and, and not paying daily and instead having some predictability and consistency when money leaves your business and, and taking into account big expenditures such as payroll and scheduling accordingly and how that all helps with forecasting because now we've got consistent revenue, invoice process, invoice timing, consistent payables, knowing when they're coming and all of that lets you predict your cash and do good forecasting. Um, is there anything that we haven't said that we should let people know? Hire people that treat your money like it's their own. Yeah. It, you know, it's funny because that's why I don't stress about cash because I know that you are going to stress about cash right. months before I even care. Uh, I worked for a company once and their, that was their expense policy. Right? <laughs> how, what, you know, what, how much money do I have to spend on the road? How, you know, spend the money like it's your own. Yeah. And, and would you make that expense if it was your own money? Uh, would you make that decision if it was your own money? If you hire enough of those type of people, they'll probably look after your cash pretty well too. That's true. You know, we're actually blessed with that at Amplify. Like book club, we have book club tomorrow. And I'll count how many people, despite the fact that if they show up, they can expense the book, come with a library book. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you could have expensed a book. I was going to buy you a book, but yet you took the time to go to the library and pick up a paper copy. And so it's quite adorable. I actually should say thank you more often that we do have people that treat the cash of our business as if it's their own and uh, and they treat their own cash far more uh, conservatively than I would treat my own cash because I haven't been to a library in a really long time. <laughs> I haven't been to a library since you made me do our meetings in libraries because we couldn't afford to have a space to actually rent. <laughs> well, we had them. We could afford it. We did Oh, right. We could afford it, but yes. we weren't going to spend the money. <laughs> it's so nice to have an office now. Okay. So, um, I think that's a wrap for cash flow, and it's been awesome. I hope it was lively. Was it lively? Uh, it was entrepreneurial, at least. Sure. So let's is lively entrepreneurial talks, and uh, and we're excited to share this information with anybody that's interested. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's with Amplify. We hope you enjoyed the show and got some value out of today's talk. If you did, we'd love to hear from you. We invite you to leave a review on your favorite podcasting platform or comment on YouTube. And be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you listen so you never miss an episode. If you'd like to check out more information on all of our episodes and free ebooks, visit amplifyadvisors.ca slash category slash Let's Media. Production of the podcast is by At Heart Creative and can be found at atheartcreative.com.